It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Welcome back to Wine to Five. Yeah, today we are going to sit back and sip along with an interview. And it's got something for everybody, including the really geeky people that love viticulture. But first, it's time to talk about what we're sipping on. Oh, it's me. Okay, so <laughs> we rehearsed this. <laughs> we rehearsed this one time and one time only. All right, I am having uh, Middle Earth Pinot Meunier Rosé. 2017 Ooh. from Nelson, New Zealand, which is part of the South Island. And I don't know if you can see the color of this bad boy stuff. And you guys, yes. I'll put a picture in the blog as well. Bright pink. It looks like strawberry juice, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And that's kind of what it tastes like. It kind of reminds me of these really ripe strawberries. That was the first thing I thought when I sipped it after lunch. I was like, hey. Yeah. And, and I just had eaten chili crunch. So I was wondering, I was like, <gasps> Yeah, chili crunch. chili crunch. I had that at my lunchtime too. It it's, it's changed my life. Okay, <laughs> uh, just saying, chili crunch. If you guys don't know what that is, there's a lot of garlic and chili pepper in there. So I was worried about what it did to my palate, but man, mm -hmm. no fear because this has got a little bit of residual sugar, just enough so you get that fruit sugar. But it is. It is summer in the glass, even though it's not summer outside. Colorado, looking at you. What about you, Steph? What do you got? I wasn't feeling like wine. I was feeling like a digestivo or aperitivo kind of a thing with uh, some, you know, bitter roots and uh, those kind of flavors. So I have a small serving of the Breckenridge Bitter uh, from Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, the distillery there. And yeah, so it's got, you know, dried herbs, roots. It's um, something to sip on. Just a light uh, yellow color. I've got two yellow, two two episodes in a row. That was not planned. No, but it wasn't. Anyway, there there you go. All so right. that's what I'm sipping on. Well, should we get into it? I think we should because this is a good one. This is a really special one. And this interview is actually back from November, and it is with Bonnie and Clark Lystra. And they are friends of Jen, who is one of our fabulous patrons, whom you've met, Steph, we've yes. had dinner with. Love Jen. They met, I think Clark and Jen met when they were in the Army. So they were my hosts when I was in Santa Rosa for Wine Bloggers Conference last year. And of course, we have that common connection via our careers in the military where, incidentally, many of us discover our bond. And we bond over a love for wine as well. I was fortunate enough to wake up every morning in their beautiful vineyard cottage, but I also got to hang out with them a little. They indulged me not only with trips to some of the finer dining establishments of the area, but also some good conversation and this interview. Yeah, and when I listen to the interview, it's a story that really speaks to those who may be, you know, dreaming of waking up one day to a vineyard outside and, you know, following your heart and following that dream of being in a vineyard. And when I first listened, I, I just thought it was such a sweet interview and uh, it was inspiring and touching. They're real people who followed their love of wine and they are now growers and it's a powerful story, and I'm so glad that Val had the chance to capture the audio and the story. So without further ado, here are Bonnie and Clark Lystra, owners of Betty Ann Vineyards. I'm here with Clark and Bonnie Lystra of Betty Ann Vineyard. For those of you that don't know, Betty Ann Vineyard is located here in Santa Rosa in Sonoma County and supplies Pinot Noir to Siduri Winery. Like me, they are veterans, retired and former active duty, and went from a lifestyle that kind of made you want to drink 
to drinking for a living, <laughs> so to speak. I don't know about if that was your case, but it was definitely my case. But I was kind of curious. A lot of people that listen do have day jobs. Some work for the government, some work for the corporate world, but a lot of them do dream of moving into the wine industry. So just kind of curious if we go back a little bit about maybe how far back your interest in wine started, and then we can talk about how you moved out here and became growers. Yeah, so I think a, a good place to start is I was raised here. I was raised in Bennett Valley. My family wasn't really, uh, they drank wine, but wasn't involved in the wine industry at all. Bennett Valley um, was really known for fruit and nuts, not necessarily grapevines, although that's a little different now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so growing up, um, really not around the, the industry, Joined the army, moved away, and through our course of uh, of being in D.C. in the great restaurant scene, we we started drinking wine and learning more about wine. And I, I think g getting involved with the industry wasn't necessarily on you know a part of our plan. Okay. Um, we did have an epiphany several years ago about eventually living here and moving out here. And once we once we made that decision, we started coming out a couple times a year. Um, from D.C., where we were living at the time, to look for property. Things had changed since I grew up, mm -hmm. and we wanted to find uh, the right spot. So we started coming out a couple times a year and working with a realtor. Um, and Bonnie has always liked real estate and you know was working closely with the realtor and getting you know updates on different properties and different areas. We started narrowing it down. But we really wanted uh, just kind of a quarter of an acre, maybe maybe even less than that of vines where, you know, I could try my hand at, at, at hobby winemaking. So that was our going in position um, and not necessarily how it turned out. And so I'll let Bonnie talk about, um, you know, actually finding this property and, and making the this, this decision to, to buy it, which it met all of our criteria, except the vineyard was too big. The vineyard was too big and yeah. so much for hobby winemaking, right? Because you're kind of, they always say, if you don't play with the big dogs, stay off the porch. If you don't want to play with the big dogs, stay on the porch, I think is Something what they like say. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. It's been a long day. But um, so you're playing with the big dogs pretty much. Yeah. yeah. We are. Yeah. And we had, like Clark said, we had looked at many properties and we had on a flight home, we drew out on the back of a napkin, if we could find the ideal house, this would be the floor plan. And we kind of filed that away. We both agreed, you know, kind of what we were ideally looking for. And we just never thought that we'd actually find it. And it was about three and a half years into our looking that friends of ours who Clark grew up with gave us a call and told us about this property that was on the market. And said, you've got to come out here. Just hop on a plane and come out for a couple of days. And I I did, And but the, but the big thing we were worried about was it had a three-acre vineyard. And I thought, what the heck? We don't know anything about growing grapes. I mean, we live in a townhouse in D.C. Yeah. And we don't even have a rake, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and uh, so I actually was on that flight coming out and convincing myself I was just going to tell the realtor, we need to just stop looking. This is this is crazy. But I continued on. I walked into the property. Clark did not come out on that flight with me. And I walked in the front door and walked through to the back of the property and saw the floor plan, saw the layout, saw the view, and I thought, this is the house. And I called Clark right away. And he said, well, what are we going to do with a three-acre vineyard? Yeah. <laughs> but as it turns out, there's there's a whole industry already in place. You don't necessarily have to know how to grow grapes. You can hire somebody to do that for you. Right. And we're very fortunate that this property, the vineyard, already had a vineyard manager in place. He's is very well known in the industry. Um, he's been around here about 30 years and had actually planted the vineyard in 2008 and had been tending it since then. So you already had an income stream in place on top of it, pretty much, because they're buying the grapes from you, and you already had somebody in place to take care of the vines. So how active are you in the grape growing and the vine tending and the agriculture? So that first year, and I was, I was still in D.C., and I was, uh, for the first year I came back and forth. And so um, Bonnie really just kind of wanted to see what the requirements were going to be um, uh, for the vineyard, 
um, throughout the year. And so uh, Jim Pratt, our vineyard manager, and Bonnie worked with him and just said, hey, Jim, you're pretty much, you've got it all, you know, throughout the year. I'm going to, you know, take notes and we're going to learn. Uh, Clark will come out and maybe be involved a little bit. Um, but Jim pretty much had it the first year uh, with his team. Uh, but since then, every year, I, when I, I came out here full time uh, in 2015, and so we'll sit down with Jim at the beginning of the year and talk about budget um, and go through each of the lines and say, well, you know, this year we're going to do this. And really it's focusing on some of the non-technical things. Okay. So his team will do you know, the, 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 the major muscle movements, if you will, the, the pruning and tying, um, the, the, to eat, anything that needs a tractor. We don't have a tractor. Um, so anything you know, that involves any chemicals that yeah. need to be reported to the state, we let him handle that. He okay. has all the licenses there. Right. Um, bird netting, uh, once the fruit starts to get ripe and, you know, end of August, uh, middle of August, we'll put bird netting up and that's that his team will do that. And then harvest, of course, right. they'll come in and, and do harvest, but we're out there, uh, a lot. Now, um, this year especially, and, and uh, Bonnie has a plan Monday through Friday to at least go through, um, there's 35 rows. Uh-huh. Um, so she'll go through seven rows a day, um, walking um, and looking and making sure uh, what needs to be done. You know, anything from, you know, canopy, uh, leaf canopy, uh, managing uh, blackberries and gophers and, <laughs> you know, that's something that comes up all the time. Blackberries. Blackberries, bushes. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah, because they're really like, bad. they're weeds. Yes. yes. Yeah. S- yeah. Special spray yeah. uh, and, you know, gophers and... Reporting back to Jim if we see anything that looks out of the ordinary. Um, you know, we're, we're the guys on the ground every day out there. So, yeah. And they'll come through with the tractor uh, and hedge the vines. So, you know, taking away some leaf, taking away the top part of right. the shoots so they, you know, stunt their growth. They'll focus right. on the grapes. Um, but it's not perfect. And we'll go back. We'll go through, walk by through, hand. and by hand. Um, manage the leaf canopy a little bit more. Man- shoot thinning. Yeah, shoot thinning. Suckers. Drop. Oh, suckers are another big thing. You yeah. know, you don't want to Explain to our listeners what suckers are for anyone who hasn't done any. <laughs> They're the little shoots that come up at the base of the vine. And anything that is not focused on producing the grapes um, is just taking energy away from that activity. So... We literally go through by hand on 3,500 vines and take off all the sun. And then shoot thinning. The shoots, there's a certain number of shoots. Yes. It's cane pruned. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we make sure that the correct number of shoots are on there and things aren't crossing and growing incorrectly so that the bunches will get, they'll develop incorrectly. Uh, So we put things in place. We have what's called a vertical shoot positioning trellis system. Yep. Um, and it requires uh, continual movement <clears throat> of the wires in order to get the vines to grow straight up instead of cascading over. Um, that seems to be the best way for Pinot to grow in this area. Um, it allows enough sunlight to get in, but not too much. But it also, um, it's because we're in the Russian River Valley, we have a lot of fog here. So we have a lot of pressure for um, things like powdery mildew. Mm-hmm. So we have to make sure that there's enough airflow through all of the, the shoots as well. So that works out well with the vertical shoot positioning. And, and so managing the wire, the trellis wires, that's another thing that, you mm-hmm. know, that we do. And that, that takes up a lot of time. Lot of they, time. they grow like slow. weeds. Yeah. And so it's a um, slow process to get the wires moved and into the right position on a regular yeah. basis. And it's front and back of every row. So, have you cut any during uh, harvest yet? We have not yet. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So this year is the first year we actually went through and did a second harvest. Okay. Our sweep harvest. And so, um, you know, the team comes through and they usually they come through at night so they can get the, the, the grapes to the winery when it's cool. And they've come at one thirty in the morning. They came at 10 o'clock uh, at night on a Thursday night this year, September, I think, 9th. And... Uh, this is the first year, though, we went back through and got those clusters that they didn't get. If they're hard to get, if they're they're near a, a post or they're right. on the backside, 
uh, of the vine. They're hidden. They can't get them. So they'll go through on the north side, uh, north facing side of, of, of the vine along the fruiting wire. And so if it's not right on the fruiting wire, they often don't get it. And so we actually went through and, and got about another quarter of a ton, a little over a quarter of a ton. We'll make, you know, probably 10 cases. That, so that was fun. First year we did that. We'll probably do it following years too. Now, tell us a little bit about the winery for which you supply the grapes. Yeah. And you were just at a dinner last night. We were. And so um, we get invited to the Sidori Wine Club uh, dinners. Um, they always invite growers to come along and uh, they designate a table um, for each of the vineyards uh, that, that are being represented. And usually Betty Ann is. So we have our own Betty Ann vineyard table and, and people who like the Betty Ann Usually we'll sit there, okay. um, and we had some new folks there this year yeah. um, who got to hear our pitch, and <laughs> uh, you know, when we, we we talk and color commentary about the vintage, this was 2015 this year, which was a little interesting because we'll average around 11 tons for the vineyard in, in, in any given harvest. 2015 tail end of the drought, the vines were kind of stressed. We kind of had some bad weather during fruit set. Uh, and so our yield was only six tons. Um, some, some folks, some vineyards out towards the coast didn't get any wow. at all. Uh, but it did result in a really nice uh, wine. Um, it's a little bit different. Our, our clone is the 828 clone. It's the, all the vineyard is 828, not a, not a, a mix. Um, and it's usually a dark, kind of a big mouthfeel, more of a Zinfandel-like or cab-like. Uh, uh, color and, and yeah. again, mouthfeel has a little bit of tannins uh, to it. Uh, but the 15 is a little lighter to, in, in color, probably a little bit more red fruit than the dark fruit. Um, and uh, nice acidity um, and people, it, right out of the bottle, it came out, right. uh, it tasted great. The 14 had some tannins to it and it needed to loosen up a little bit and it did that in the bottle. Yeah. So initially uh, the 14 was pretty tight, um, but over the year, um, it's loosened up 15 right off the bat. So it was nice to drink that last night. Uh, nice to talk to people about that last night. Uh, Why don't you tell them a little bit about Adam Lee, the winemaker? Well, Adam is yeah. good friends with Jim Pratter, vineyard manager. Adam and his wife, Diana, started Surrey about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, they came from Austin, Texas, um, and worked for a couple local wineries before they went ahead and started making their own label at Surrey. Um, since then, he's garnered a huge following. Uh, three years ago, he was bought by Jackson Family Wines. Right. Uh, and so I think that's that's helped him, and, and I think it's going to be a launch pad for some other projects. He was at the Wine Bloggers Conference uh, this weekend and got to talk to him about his latest uh, project. Diane is also going to start a, a new label uh, of sparkling uh, called Flaunt. I'm excited about that yeah. because I love the name, first of all. It sounds sassy. I love sparkling. And sparkling Pinot? Sparkling Pinot. I'm pretty sure she's like going to make it a out rose of or a, like a Blanc de Noir. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I am looking forward to that coming out. Sure, we share whatever information. Yes, we hear. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. so now Adam was at the Wine Bloggers Conference all weekend. He was. And I didn't run into him at all. There were so many people I did not run into at the Wine Bloggers Conference, but um, maybe sometime we could get him to come on and tell us a little bit more about Siduri as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Emily Martin. I'm, I don't know if you know her blog. She. I just read it on Facebook. She interviewed him. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah. So it was nice to see him last night. It was a nice event. Mm -hmm. Jim Pratt and Adam have known each other for a long time. So that's a really key relationship is making sure um, the vineyard manager, um, uh, gets along with the winemaker and they understand uh, each other's priorities uh, because especially uh, towards the end of the year when the fruit starts ripening, that uh, vineyard manager, winemaker relationship is really important. Getting that harvest date, making sure we're doing everything we need to be doing in the vineyard uh, along with Jim to make sure that that fruit's ready to go. Um, once Adam and, and, and Ryan Zapoltis, who's the assistant winemaker, um, decide they need to pick. This year, we did have the 17 vintage. We did have a little bit of rain, like just before, uh, a couple of days before our, our pick date. And so they, they moved it up. Uh, so right after the rain, they went ahead and picked. So I think it's going to be fine. And when did you pick this year? I think it was the 9th of September. About a month before the fires. Yes. And of course, um, I'm here about two weeks after the fires have been... 
Just about a month. Of almost a month now they've been out? A, no, they haven't been out that long. They yeah. started on the 9th of October. Right. Took about I think three so. weeks. Yeah. 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 So they are out now, but I mean, I did the drive over to Napa today and I saw a lot of the devastation, even just sitting on the back deck over at the uh, Silverado on the back patio of the country club there you could look up into the hills and you can see also you could see the was it the tubs fire right that yeah, you guys, fire, yeah right. that you guys had on this mm-hmm. side because there were what 11 fires going or something like that yeah there yeah. were a bunch yeah, yeah. yeah. so murdering. nuns atlas and tubs were right. the ones right by here well the interesting thing is so we're we're about three and a half miles uh, southwest of coffee park mm-hmm. um Siduri, the wine facility is in coffee park so Adam, uh, I think it was the Tuesday or Wednesday after, uh, so the, like the 11th, he did a little walkthrough and, and let everyone know that uh, the winery was okay, didn't affect the grapes that were in the winery, and so the little industrial park that Siduri, along with a couple brewers, uh, craft brewers are in, that, that was fine, but they're, it's, it's right in the middle of Coffee Park. It's amazing wow. that it jumped over their facility, and they were out of power for about a week. They managed to get a generator. They brought in dry ice originally to keep uh, take care of the fer- uh, fermentation because all the grapes were in the fermentation. Yeah, that's what uh, the Signorello's winemaker yeah. talked about yesterday is how they were able to save that wine because the winery burned down all the right. tank and and how they were able to to have wine that didn't turn to vinegar when they weren't able to punch them down or supply power to right. the tanks or the temperature control aspect of it. So I think most people had their grapes in. There was maybe some mm-hmm. Cabernet out. Uh, most people had it in and, and got very lucky as far right. as, as far as, I mean, considering 8,000 structures total were lost. Right. So so a lot of people will always ask me, so you're going to have a vineyard, you're going to move out to wine country and live the dream. And I'm like, no, I don't need that stress. How stressful is it? I mean, do you worry when hail comes? Do you f- freak out when the weather, you know? You know, it's such a different level of stress than we had um, in, in the our government. previous yeah. lives. Living in D.C. was always stressful every day, but for very different reasons. You know, here, uh, yeah, the weather is probably our biggest stress. When we get out, that's the first thing I do in the morning is I look yeah. at what the weather forecast is. Yeah, well, we've been fortunate to have some folks in the industry that have that you know have helped us and you know guide us and informed us. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those is Jim Ricard of uh, Jay Ricard's Winery um, up in Cloverdale, up in Alexander Valley, and he was the person we reached out to to ask him about this commercial vineyard, <laughs> um, and he has also talked to us about you know, just. He's, he's recorded the weather every day for the last 40 years. Um, and, you know, we, after hearing that, you know, a few years ago, it's like, oh, wow, that's, that seems pretty intense. Well, you do that. You right. know, and you start, especially, you know, March through September when, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, the, 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 from bud mm-hmm. break to harvest, you, you watch it every day. And yeah. so that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's, you know, that's not that stressful. Yeah. You get, you know, <laughs> you see the rain coming in. Why is it raining in June? It never rains here in June. And you might yeah. get a day or so. Okay. So that's a little stressful. But, it, you know, it's, it's wine country stress. It, yeah. It's, it's, wine, it's a different kind of stress. <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, I was always like, well, I don't, I don't need to worry about glass of wing sharpshooters. And I don't want to worry about <laughs> hail. Yeah. And Oh, frost and taking out my entire vintage you know those are the kind of things that's a different kind of stress because you can't control it right so it's it's a different kind of and you're so lucky you had a team in place and pretty much a system so you just kind of yeah. got to move in and just and learn. start learning yeah. right yeah and so we've both taken advantage of the junior college center yes. junior college is a great viticulture and enology program that we both taken advantage of and clark's a little more interested in the winemaking side right. of things i'm right. more interested in the uh the actual growing and tending to them, the viticulture side. Yeah, so it's so, a good partnership. Yeah, so we both get out in the, uh, we both get out in the vineyard, and we both, uh, you know, I, I rent equipment to to make the the wine, and we both okay. get out and do that too. So it's right. been fun. So uh, since you've been here, and we always ask our guests to talk about uh, something that might have happened since you've been here that was funny or embarrassing or maybe you asked a stupid question and, and, and then you realize, oh, why did I say that? What's the funniest thing or most embarrassing thing that's happened to you since you've moved here and, and embraced the wine country lifestyle? Well, I think so. We're, we're um, part of the Russian 
uh, River Valley wine growers. Um, you know, we've been involved and I'm active with a couple of their committees. Uh, and I think one of the first events we went to, uh, I was talking to this uh, older gentleman, uh, uh, owned a vineyard here for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, he asked me, hey, so how do you farm your grapes? And I'll tell you, it was a blank look. <laughs> I had a blank look. And I, I didn't know how to answer that question. You know, I realized I was so new. And it's like, I, so I remember driving home with Bonnie. I, I, well, I, I actually just kind of smiled and I think I just kind of walked away from him. But it's kind of rude. It's, but that said, driving home, <laughs> I was asking Bonnie, never again is that going to happen. So, you know, so we're, on the, we're on the learning curve yeah. you know, as of right now. And that's the first question I'm going to be able to answer. So, you know, now we, we, we've got the whole, you know, head train, cane prune, VSP. So I yeah. know the answer to the question. Irrigation. Understand how it works. Yeah. 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 So, you know, we're not dry farmers. Right. So right. It, uh, not we now know vines. the difference between cane pruned and cordon and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> sustainable. So we are sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And we just we got that designation at the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, mm-hmm. that Jim Pratt, vineyard manager, you know, uh, went through that process right. for us. And um, I think the county's got a pretty ambitious goal to get everyone, I think, in the next five years uh, sustainable. So it was nice for us to do that. And our Jackson family. Uh, wants all their vineyards to be sustainable and they're working right. towards that goal. So, And is there a chance you could explain to our listeners the difference between sustainable and organic? There's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, the sustainable program in California is um, there's it's a certification that you have to go through. It's 132 points that you have to explain and it's it's basically making sure that what you're doing in the way that you farm your property will be long lasting. You're not doing damage to the property Mm -hmm. so that, that the activities will continue, you know, have the ability to continue into the future where everything has to be documented and recorded and, Mm -hmm. and keep accurate records and all of that. So organic, completely different, a different set of criteria in order to meet that standard. And we are not organic. Um, we try to limit the amount of chemicals that we do use. And we try to use as many organic materials as we can. In fact, it's a good thing that you came this week because last week we had our compost spread. Okay. Um, <laughs> yay. <laughs> uh, but that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely a totally different standard. And then the next one above that then is biodynamic. And there are, there are several uh, wineries in, in Sonoma County that have met that. Um, it, is a, it is a very difficult commitment to make. And it's expensive. Uh, it is. Very expensive. And if your neighbor isn't following your practices, then your property is at risk for not being able to be certified as well. So, you know, sustainable, integrated pest management, mm-hmm. things like that, versus, you know, the whole bearing the cow horn full of manure, right. <laughs> right. leaf days, right. and all that. But is there anything else you'd like to add about what you love now about your life versus the uh, the, the life of the, uh, the federal world inside the Beltway? Well, I'll tell you, it, it's it, we haven't really gone on vacation since we've been here because this is a vacation. You know, even out working in the vineyard or out working on another part of the property, it, it's, you know, when you come back and you can uh, have a glass of wine and take a look at the view we have here with vineyard front and back and the beautiful sky, uh, and you're just seconds away from these great farm to table or I guess the term now is farm driven restaurants. It's just, it's just a great place to be. And, and, and so, it's so different from from the, the old DC lifestyle uh, that it's kind of hard to believe that we ever were actually there for 15 years. <laughs> well, I think a yeah. lot of people are going to be jealous to to hear about your experience, how you were able to do this, because a lot of people would say you're living the dream. It well, does feel like that. It, well, it definitely unfolded it like that as we started the conversation. You know, having this vineyard and being involved in the industry like we are right now yeah. wasn't part of the dream. We both like yeah. wine and and. But it is, has turned out really nice, uh, and being part of the industry uh, and growing into it, um, people are very receptive. You know, the learning environment has been great. They help. 
Um, so yeah, it's yeah I think that's one of the things that I didn't expect when coming out here and starting this was how the other members of the industry really support each other. And now being members of the Russian River Wine Growers Association, um, we've met a lot more people. We also go out and we wine taste and we tell people that we're growers. And, mm -hmm. and everybody is just genuinely looking out for each other. You don't, <laughs> one thing that I feel is so different from D.C. is it doesn't feel competitive here. Right. at all. It's, it's not eat your very, own. Like right. it's, it's, we say eat your own. Yeah. It's very, very <laughs> supportive. So, um, you know, there's, there's resources, anybody who needs anything. And I, and I think that's definitely has been shown over this last month as people needed help. Jim gave an example of someone who, um, he didn't, he, wasn't working for who had a vineyard out toward the coast and because of the fires they hadn't harvested yet but all his workers left immediately after the fire oh. and he called Jim and Jim said I'll send my crew out there we'll get your vineyard picked and that's the kind of thing people do here yeah so you've kind of moved out here and, and have a ready-made family and yeah. a group of yeah. friends and I yeah. couldn't ask for anything else. No, and so and I think we heard at the at the bloggers conference um, this weekend yeah. that Sonoma County is open for business. That's Russian right. River Valley is open for business. That's right. Yeah. Buy up um, people. So come yeah. on out, come on out and visit. <laughs> yeah, um, there's plenty of wine. Yeah. Yep, that's that's pretty much what everybody I've talked to this week and this weekend has said. It's like you know the best way to help with recovery efforts is to buy the wine. Yeah, and uh, drink up. So with that. I want to thank you guys so much for spending some time with me. Let me hang out in your, your beautiful cottage here for, you know, the, almost a week. And uh, well, we're happy to have you showing yeah. me some beautiful parts of Santa Rosa that I had no idea even existed. So thank you guys so much. Well, thanks, Paul. All right. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. See, we knew you guys would love them as much as we did. Right, Steph? Oh, yeah. I mean, I just listened and was like very touched. So these people followed their hearts from inside the Beltway to outside in wine country. And if you caught that interview, there was so many great little pieces. But the part about the idea being written on the back of a napkin, and then they become growers of 35 rows of Pinot Noir. I know. And I thought it was so funny because she was like, no, the vineyard's too big. She's like, we live in a <laughs> juicy townhouse. We didn't even own a rake. <laughs> I think that was funny. <laughs> and now they're taking classes at the community college and they're learning about how to work in these vineyards. But, you know, we should also mention that they've got their own vineyard manager and winemaker and everything. So the house came you know, ready to kind of just ready to move in. Yeah, it was like a turnkey operation. Right. And what I thought was also something we should mention is we're going to talk about how Clark started his blog, Drinking on the Job, which has to do with tasting rooms. So it's not what you think. But he has been, Clark has been working with the Sonoma County Administrator, and he's been working to help develop the county's wildfire recovery plan. So as this podcast episode goes to air, uh, hopefully we'll be uh, sporting some new content on that blog because, of course, you know, Clark had to kind of lay that down so he could help work with that. And you guys remember those fires and he talked about those in the interview as well. I think with that, we should move on to Wino Radar. And like I mentioned, Clark's new blog, Drinking on the Job, it was launched in, I believe, November, if not December. And the gist of it is kind of how to get the most out of the wine tasting room experience. And he has all kinds of tips and advice and recommendation on local tasting rooms, and he visits them. And he also... Uh, again, they are foodies. They know those restaurants and they took me to some fabulous ones. That's cool. And if you guys are looking for any more Sonoma wineries, you know, tasting rooms, events or other resources for a trip that you might have planned or maybe you're like, uh, maybe I should check this out and then plan a trip. There's a couple other links that we have uh, it for you in the blog. One of them is new to our wino radar called Wine Country Channel, and it's a free internet-based internet, internet -based 
high def TV network. So beautiful videos, something to go look at uh, if you're going to Sonoma. Also, localwineevents.com. Don't forget about that. That is a great website and app to find local beverage and food events and other tours and things like that. So, and if you missed our episode with Eric V. Orange from Local Wine Events, that was episode 157. And then Wine Roots. Val also hooked up with them when she was at the Wine Bloggers Conference. And we mentioned them in episode 137. Wine Roots is a great way um, you can use their app or their website to plan and design your wine tasting tour. And they specifically focus on Napa, Sonoma, Healdsburg, and St. Helena. And then lastly, uh, don't forget that there's another resource called Kazit. It's a worldwide winery guide for your mobile or desktop. And they also have event listings. So there's lots of resources in our blog um, for you guys to look at. Oh, and more will be coming. I mean, it's like there's something new every day. So we know we don't cover them all, but more will be coming, of course. And as we move into the shout outs, we definitely have to send a big thank you out to Bonnie and Clark for the in-person on-location interview and their blog and their hospitality. And you can connect with them on the social spaces at DOTJ blog. Also, special shout out to Jim Pratt, the vineyard manager at Betty Ann Vineyards. You get a shout out too. And Flaunt, the new sparkling wine by Diana Novi Lee that we talked about. And she is Adam Lee, the winemaker. She's his wife. And Steph, I thought you would like that Flaunt. Yeah. It's just such a cool label and such a cool idea. So that's kind of cool that they're kind of expanding their winemaking there too. And of course, one more to Suduri Wines and their story. We'll link that up for you and you can connect with them in the social spaces at Suduri Wines. And moving on to our Patreon love segment. Thank you to our Reserva Superiore supporter, Robin Sauls from the Triple G Girls Gone Grape. And to our Reserva supporter, Auntie in Georgia, our Tenacious Tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, Jen in Maryland, David and Lisa in Illinois, Anne-Marie in Virginia, and it's not five o'clock and we don't care. Who are those listeners, Val? Well, we have Meg in South Dakota. We've got Clay in Arizona. In California, we have John, Andrew, Aswani, Chantel's in Ontario, Canada. Mary Lou is in Pennsylvania, currently in France, I believe. Mm -hmm. Kathy is in Georgia. Colorado right here is Chris and Janet and Diane. Actually, in Colorado right here are Chris and Janet and Diane. I went to English class. In Illinois, <laughs> Steve and Renee. I speak the English. Kathy in Tennessee. Ashley in North Carolina. Sean in Ohio. And guess what? We have our tastemaker listeners. David's in Scotland. Carol's in Kentucky. Karen's in California. Chip and Katie are in Pennsylvania, my home state. Danielle is here as well, and we have our first new patron from New York, Serena. Serena, welcome to the Patreon Pack. If you would like to be part of our Patreon Pack, you can go to our Patreon page for more details. It's patreon.com slash wine to five podcast, and you can be entered into our monthly giveaways, exclusive content, and get some cool swag. Go to our website, wine to five.com, and you can shop with our affiliates for books and art and travel and clubs and gifts and all kinds of joy there and see some really cool pictures as well. And in between each episode every week, we are also on the social spaces at Wine25. So please engage with us there. We also have a private Facebook group called the Wine25 Community. You can connect personally with Val on Twitter. That's where she's at. She loves to be on Twitter at WineGalUnboxed. You can also find her on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Vino with Val. And I am online as the Wine Heroine. So until next week, everybody, cheers. cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips. Tips.